so much of the municipal efforts and rightfully so the advocacy to cities and to state federal governments has been around composting or creating centralized digestion. Um, and I think that, that it's so important that we remember that that is the middle to bottom of our hierarchy and that we really need to be thinking about how do we structurally change the incentives that are causing this waste to not be consumed by people. everybody here is interested in food waste because it's a really important topic and for those of you who are expecting Deb Darby as your moderator she broke her ankle and she couldn't come and so she asked me to pinch it so um, I'm here um, we, you guys can take a seat um, so I am a um, the principal of Perlmutter Associates where I'm a got a small consulting practice based here in Cambridge and I do work in different aspects of clean tech and I have been in the um, waste business, the zero waste business for all of my career, and as my mother likes to say, I have a degree in dreck. Um, <laughs> so anyway, we're gonna, I'm going to let the other panelists introduce themselves, and then we're going to jump into some questions for them, which hopefully will answer everything you want to know about food waste, and then we'll have about 10 minutes at the end for Q&A from you. Great. So Jonathan. Okay. Ah, hello everyone. My name is Jonathan Crohn's. Um, I'm an industrial ecologist, which means that I use uh, engineering and interdisciplinary methods to kind of understand material systems, and I have a focus on waste systems and sustainable waste systems. I'm currently a visiting assistant professor at Boston College, um, and I'm really excited to be here and to, sh you know, engage with old friends and collaborators to, to uh, really work on this important problem. Thanks. Similarly, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Caroline Howe. I currently work for the DC Department of Energy and Environment as an urban sustainability analyst with a focus of implementing our DC sustainability plan, which includes really ambitious targets for uh, reducing food waste and for reducing our waste as a city as a whole. I am surprised to be here as a city official because I consider myself, I am at heart an entrepreneur, um, and I've had several businesses in waste and renewable energy and in food waste specifically and so I'm really excited that in my role now working for the city that we're really looking at how we can be supporting entrepreneurs and I'm and grateful that my career in zero waste has taken me all over the world to work with food waste and waste diversion uh, across our planet. Great, thank you and um, I know you might be because of this missing part of the debate tonight. And so I was hoping we'd get some Bernie and Elizabeth kind of sparks up here, but they assure me that they agree on everything. So I don't know if that's gonna happen. We'll see. <laughs> anyway, so um, I wanna start with just asking maybe Jonathan, why should we care and why should we be taking action about food waste? Uh, you, you probably have, if you've paid attention to this problem of food waste, it's been called one of the world's stupidest problems uh, because it is an enormous waste of something that people all around the world actively need. Uh, there are some statistics which, you know, you could take some issue with potentially, but the, the, that roughly a third of all food that is produced for sale uh, is wasted in one way or another. Um, and that represents an enormous loss of opportunity for feeding the, the billion or so people around the planet who are, who are you know, uh, experiencing food insecurity. Um, but beyond that, there are uh, numerous environmental issues and environmental reasons to care about food waste. Huge amounts of water and fossil fuels and nutrients and land go into cultivating this material which immediately becomes wasted. Um, and as you travel down the material or the product life cycle from growing the food to transporting it, transporting it, packing it, uh, converting it into a saleable product, uh, storing it in a market, transporting it again, storing it at home, and eventually making its way into the waste system, the environmental costs add up. And uh, focusing specifically on the end of life, um, food waste, gets converted into methane often in, in its end of life, which is a, a, a very important and powerful greenhouse gas. Um, 
uh, you know, if, in the city of Boston and in, the, in this area where our garbage uh, gets dealt with in incinerators, it actually brings down the effectiveness of waste to energy plants because it's wet. Anybody try to burn wet anything, you realize you need to have more fuel. So it's actually, you know, not a great thing to, to put into the, into the waste stream. Um, and something that, that I'm particularly interested in as well is food waste and other putrescible wastes in the waste stream itself are occupational risks for, for waste workers. Uh, not just here in formalized waste systems, but all around the world. Uh, Caroline can speak more about, about that and her experiences, uh, but uh, you know, disease vectors and, and all sorts of things. So it is a, it, a tremendously you know, stupid problem and it's multifaceted in the types of costs that are associated with it. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. I think that in thinking about its carbon emissions and the impact that food waste has on our global climate, some of the statistics show that if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter in the world. That sticks with me. Um, and particularly if you look at the entire scale where essentially all of the energy and fossil fuels that are going into production are wasted if we're wasting that food. Taking it down to a city level, um, DC, our numbers look fairly similar to the national level where we're looking at a third to 40% of food waste being thrown away in, in our city. Um, while one in four children in DC goes to school hungry. So at a very local level, this connection, um, at the global level, the climate impacts. And to echo uh, Jonathan's point about the, in the waste stream, certainly it has an impact on waste collectors, waste haulers, and on the communities who bear the burden of waste passing through their communities. And we know that waste um, and the burden of waste processing is unequally distributed, both in our country and globally, in terms of the communities that are impacted by that. And the more food waste that, and the more food that ends up in our waste system, the harder it is to capture any value from, whether that's in recycling or in, as you said, wherever the waste is going, whether it's ending up the, the non-recyclables, which again, should be a very small fraction of our waste, whether that's going to an incinerator or to a landfill, food waste, yeah, it remains a real problem. And so when we look at goals like ours of reducing um, our waste stream by 80% by 2050, we need to get food waste out of that, supply out of the waste stream in order to be capturing value from our recyclables and doing anything productive without remaining waste. And it's the easiest third to get out of our waste stream, right? Um, and I just want to add just from what Jonathan said about food creating, food waste creating methane in landfills. and. I know, you know some people say, well, we've got methane capture systems in the landfills, but those capture systems only capture about 30% of the methane generated in the landfill. The other 70% goes up into the atmosphere. And um, there's some landfills that actually speed up that decomposition so that they can um, capture more methane, but that just means more methane is going up into the atmosphere more rapidly, because again, they can only capture a small amount. And so that's pretty scary right now. Um, so let me move on to ask, um, EPA has, I'm gonna ask Caroline, EPA has a food waste hierarchy, and I'm wondering um, if you can talk a little bit about that and how we can put incentives in place to, um, to get more movement to follow that hierarchy. Yeah, thank you. So I think one of the things that we were discussing beforehand is, you know, e even calling it food waste, um, that if we're actually looking from the EPA and USDA's food hierarchy, starting from the very top where we should be actually removing the bulk is, is not having it go to waste. So having it actually reach um, people and having it primarily, again, looking at it from an economic and entrepreneurship perspective, being able to first be sold to people, then be donated to people who need it, being able to get food to people, um, then to animals, which I think is very interesting. We'll hear more about that later from uh, one of our startups, but getting food to animals. Um, and then, only then, after we've looked through in any way that it can be s consumed in the purpose that we invested the fossil fuels and the water and the land in producing it, only then should we be looking at it as, um, as a nutrient, which is what it is. It is nutrients that can go back into our soil through composting, through biogas. Um, and so first looking at capturing the nutrients from it, then the embodied gas through biogas or some other kind of um, digestion that enables us to capture the embodied energy in it and that methane for energy. And then only then, the very smallest bit of our pyramid, um, which is it, the food waste hierarchy is a reverse pyramid 
pyramid. Um, so only the very bottom should we be looking at some other way to be processing our food waste. So capturing methane in landfills or things like that. And so I think when we're thinking about from a city perspective, so much of the municipal efforts, and rightfully so, the advocacy to cities and to state federal governments has been around composting or creating centralized digestion. Um, and I think that, that it's so important that we remember that that is the middle to bottom of our hierarchy and that we really need to be thinking about how do we structurally change the incentives that are causing this waste to not be consumed by people. And some of that is aesthetic um, and in thinking about why food remains on farms um, and isn't sold because it doesn't have enough value in the marketplace, either because it is perceived of as not fitting our perfect aesthetic standards or because it is a part of the vegetable that we're not used to consuming. Um, and then throughout the supply chain, lots of other um, barriers to it. But I've been really inspired by um, some of the locations that are really in that on-farm, in distribution, really looking at how we incentivize um, all people throughout the supply chain to be capturing more value from it. And in part, that's because we're not currently putting a price, the fair price, on waste, or it's not visible to us um, in the supply chain. Um, and so while it is said, again, thinking about how much food waste is thrown away even at home, that the average American household is throwing away $1,200 of food, uh, on an annual basis, and so you know, several a hundred to several hundred dollars a, um, a month, and that is again not equitably distributed through our society. Uh, the the costs of that, and so I think that when we start to put more accurate pricing, um, and when we start to really be incentivizing <coughs> higher up in the supply chain, uh, incentivizing farmers and distributors to be distributing what may not be as attractive, incentivizing large scale processors and chefs to be using those underutilized parts of, of vegetables and that ugly produce. And we're starting to see a lot of innovation in that space in terms of startups across the country too. Um, to add to that, one part of the hierarchy that's often not emphasized and it's not really relevant at a city level is the, uh, you can think about it as an industrial mm. use, but not, not just a use, but industrial production of food waste. You know, in food processing and food, there's a lot of parts of our food which is not edible and that also gets credited as waste. And some of my work has gone into trying to quantify the amount of waste that gets generated upstream before we even engage with not just food, but any stuff. There's a lot of waste that's generated by our industries, including food waste. In, in my work, I've found that in the US, it's between 30 and 40 million tons a year of food waste gets generated by um, uh, slaughterhouses and packing plants and, and you know, the, the businesses upstream. And to their credit, much of that gets dealt with what's called beneficially. So it's sort of the industrial waste term for recycling. Um, but it's not always, and I, I'd, I'd argue that most of it is, doesn't go to what we call, would call the highest and best use. Mm -hmm. It goes to what is convenient. So if there's a company you know, down the road, they've made a relationship, and so they can send some of their food waste to be animal bedding, for instance. Maybe there would be, have been an opportunity to actually use some of those food wastes, like citrus peels, for instance, which is used to extract uh, chemicals, uh, both for, uh, for fragrances as well as for, for, commodity, for commodity chemicals manufacturing. So there's actually, I would say, a really exciting opportunity in that area, which is very different from when most of us are excited about dealing with food waste, mm. this is something that's invisible to us, and yet it is a major fraction of the organic waste burden that we have to deal with. I, that's an important point, and I think that's actually, it is true of every material that we look at, right? There's something called the Wasteberg, that's referred to as the Wasteberg, which is that there's 71 times more waste created in the making of a product before it gets to us than there is when we dispose of that product. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's pretty mind-boggling, but that's a topic for another night, perhaps. Except that I can't actually, I can't actually let, uh, okay, cause, because ahead. we're being videotaped, that was, the su that was actually the subject of my PhD dissertation, and I found that that number's not right. Okay, okay, good. So what is it? Uh, it's about one-to-one. -one. Okay, Yeah. that's good to know. I will, it's still, I will not use it's still, that. It's still an enormous amount. It's still about 250 to 300 million tons of waste okay. produced by industry. I'm going to take that slide okay. out of my zero waste okay, presentation. Great. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Well, I, I, I will say that on that, the industrial perspective, I have been really surprised when looking at municipal um, composting throughout the country that there's actually a huge amount of action in uh, the middle of our country, um, in that there's huge amounts of industrial food production there. And so actually one of the most interesting industrial symbioses that I've come across in this food space is just that in thinking about Pepperidge Farm, um, huge manufacturing plants near Minneapolis and the county Minneapolis, if, are, if there are any Minneapolis in the audience, yes. Um, real leader on composting and part that's coming from Pepperidge Farms manufacturing, actually all of the waste uh, bready stuff, dough, um, goes into pet food. So is that exactly what we want our pets eating? Slaughterhouse byproducts and gluteny dough? I'm not sure, um, but that is interesting that that's where yeah. that's going and that that can actually then inform and support municipalities for thinking about it similarly symbiotically. Yeah. Neat. Thank you. Um, so Jonathan, <laughs> tell me, like, what do you think some of the barriers are to better management of and meeting the hierarchy. Yeah. Well, I think you know, changing the focus back to to, to you know the sort of consumption wastes that that a lot of us are more familiar with. A lot of it has to do. I think it's already been brought up with the economics of the way that our our waste system works, that we don't immediately shoulder the burdens of of kind of the, the cost of disposing of the food. It still is perceived, even if some of the realities may be shifting, it's still perceived as cheaper to buy new and to throw out in, in sort of a consumer culture. And so this is not at all unique to food waste. This is something that we're up against in efforts to, to, to move towards a circular economy or to zero waste in all of the material streams. But um, you know, I, I know that there's, there are uh, startups that are focusing on information and on, on dealing with the transaction costs issue around trying to create some of these markets around food waste, which previously has been an incredible barrier. And now with available technology, that cost is is declining, and so uh, you know there are these openings to really extract value and to 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 shift the the dial on on value creation uh, in food waste utilization. Does anybody want to add to that? I'm good. Okay, and then um, we talked earlier um, when we were sort of prepping for this about the whack-a-mole effect. Do you oh, want to talk yes. about that? Yeah, sure. So. Um, Th this isn't necessarily a, necessarily a barrier, but it's something that I try to talk about every time I talk to people. I have a captive audience to talk about waste. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's my dream. How often does that happen? Uh, yeah, well, every time I lecture, right? It's, yeah. Um, and the, uh, um, I try to emphasize that waste is one part of a broad interconnected system. And that when we try to develop proposals or strategies or policies or businesses or technologies that focus on reducing or utilizing waste in one place, we have to remember that that is going to have ramifications throughout the, not just the waste system, but the material system. And so many proposals which let's say change the economic proposition of producing a waste in one place, you're going to see effects of that. Uh, firstly, in the, the food waste chain, the value chain. So you're going to see potentially wastes being generated elsewhere. And while I know that kind of the way that you know, markets are, tend to work is, OK, well, that creates a new opportunity for somebody else to come in. But because we are involved in this process, in this project of trying to reduce waste altogether, we want to be cognizant that the proposals that we have or the, 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 the you know, businesses that we have don't net increase food waste somewhere else. But beyond that, it affects potentially other sorts of uh, waste streams. And beyond that, also, the types of environmental impacts that waste is, is contributing to. Uh, an anecdote, if I have a couple yeah, seconds to share. I'm familiar with um, uh, the situation in the, in the UK. 10 or 15 years ago, there was a policy uh, uh, set at the, fe at the national level to reduce food waste from supermarkets. And the, the National Waste Agency, which is an amazing agency, uh, it's a sort of quasi-governmental called RAP, uh, Waste and Resources Action Program, I think, uh, worked with the supermarkets to package everything and to increase the amount of packaging in the supermarkets because when food is packaged, it has, it's more shelf stable and it lasts longer. And they were successful at reducing the amount of food waste at the expense of increasing the amount of plastic waste. And so we can debate on the mer relative merits of that, but it was clearly a policy decision to reduce food waste. And 
the implications were that, okay, now we have more plastic waste. We have tools in industrial ecology in order to evaluate the environmental effects of this. Uh, it's called life cycle assessment. You can look at kind of overall what, let's say, the carbon implications are of a particular policy. But of course, as you've heard, food doesn't just exist in an environmental realm. So it becomes a, a bit more complicated to actually try to balance these uh, complex and multifaceted policy objectives. Yeah, and I think that thinking from a city perspective, the ways in which we're managing or responsible for these different elements of the supply chain are split into different agencies at a city level, even thinking about from one institution, whether that's a hotel or a university, in terms of the amount of food waste that's being produced, it's actually split where the savings might be and where the expenses might be, where the benefit might be. And so that's all the more important to be able to bring people together in a room and say, how do we balance these different priorities? That's one reason why I love being in a sustainability team within a city where we actually, our sustainability plan has 27 agencies throughout the city that came together along with thousands of residents to create this plan that we could all agree met and balanced those separate goals. But it also means every month the DC Food Recovery Working Group comes together and those are concerned residents and entrepreneurs and people from 10 different city agencies, the Department of Parks and Rec that serves a lot of the summer meals and um, the Department of Economic Development that is concerned about how we create entrepreneurs in, in, in this sector. And so really having people come to the same table and say, yes, we wanna preserve food. How do we make sure that that packaging is recyclable or having those kinds of conversations is super interesting. And another very specific barrier that I think is true and I've seen this in cities across the US and certainly around the world is that when we look at capturing food waste for entrepreneurial value in particular or for community value is that the the opportunities for shared kitchen space is a very specific <coughs> barrier that I've seen cities all across the country face whereas if you don't have shared kitchen space if you don't have commercial kitchen space that anyone can access to when it's peak basil season and your process, there's huge amounts of basil in the supply chain that is going to be wasted. Or in the peak of tomato season where you really need to be capturing it and making it shelf stable in order to be distributing that food waste throughout a community. Um, the importance of that shared kitchen space and it is in the cities where we're seeing rents increase, um, the harder and harder it becomes to have those kinds of spaces. It's a very specific barrier. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk a little bit more about policy? What are some of the policies that we would be helpful to get into place to help minimize food waste and manage it properly? <coughs> Totally, so first of all, really encouraging distributors or uh, I know regulation is mixed, mixed views here, but um, actually making it, uh, many European countries have actually made it illegal for supermarkets to be throwing food away. Um, and that does create a real opportunity, whether that's something like the Daily Table, uh, which if you don't know about here in Boston, definitely encourage you to check out, started by the founder of Trader Joe's that actually sells almost like about to expire foods at lower costs. Um, and more and more supermarkets do that and technology enables um, distributors to be able to be uh, moderating price so that it is much less expensive when it's about to expire, really incentivizing people to be consuming and eating that first. Um, so actually just making it essentially illegal to separate food waste. Um, in DC, currently under review is a zero waste omnibus bill, which would require any restaurant that has more than 50 employees to be donating, that they also cannot throw food into the mixed municipal waste stream, that it would have to be donated or composted. Um, and I think really putting that price, because currently it is much less expensive on the check to be um, throwing food waste into the municipal waste stream than it is to be composting. Um, and it's uh, we've also put in place incentives so that uh, restaurants, again, or hotels, or any other large institution can be uh, getting tax incentives for the food that they're donating um, and protecting them regulatorily. So in the US, uh, we actually, the Good Samaritan Act protects any food donor donating food in 
good faith um, to be protected, but because that actually hasn't been tried in the courts, many big donors are still concerned about being held liable if anyone does get sick, um, regardless of whether that food was handled well in their care or in the rest of the supply chain. Um, and so because that hasn't been tried, there's still some skepticism and concern about that. Um, and so DC actually passed additional re legislation to make it, even though it's essentially the same law, making it even more clear to restaurants that they're protected. Um, and then, you know, I see it as thinking about these uh, at both a macro and micro level to be really creating the physical infrastructure, uh, technological infrastructure, and having cities, states, our federal government be supporting that to be getting to a place where we are able to get food from where it is being produced to where it needs to go. And I'd say in, in Massachusetts, we have some laws that are really good. So we've got a law that says that any generator of a ton per week of food has to, um, cannot dispose of it. They have to recycle it in some way. Um, and the solid waste plan, I think, is looking at changing that threshold to half a ton per week. Um, and then we also have our, our uh, Clean Energy Center provides incentives for anaerobic digesters um, to be built, and that's part of our renewable energy portfolio as well. Um, Jonathan, anything you want to add on policy? Um, only to talk about that there's a, a bunch of different designs for this, uh, to try to create a market for the development, for investment in infrastructure. It's very costly. I mean, it, it's uh, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars to build uh, processing, recycling facilities at the scale that's necessary, um, particularly for, you know, I know that there are a number of restaurants that focus on, on how everything in the restaurant is, quote, compostable, but it's, you know, uh, small-scale composters aren't, can't effectively deal with non-food uh, you know, materials, particularly polylactic acid and other sorts of, uh, of, of, you know, marketed anyway as compostable yeah. plastic. Um, it's not going to be adequately dealt with. And so I just wanted to, to uh, say that, so in Massachusetts, we have a generator trigger uh, for the policy. In Connecticut, it's a, um, a distance trigger. So if you are a large generator and mm -hmm. there is a facility close enough to you, I don't remember the, the radius, but... It, is it tw tw 20 miles, something like that? It's, it's a, it's a, if there is a facility that is close enough, then you're required to, uh, to send it anywhere. You obviously don't have to send it there. Uh, but it's just an interesting policy design, an experiment yeah. between the two states to see which policy might be more effective. And um, let me just add, I, the subject of compostable plastics is very <laughs> interesting yeah. and important, at least to me. Um, so if you want to know more about that, Feel free to ask about that in the Q&A. Um, <laughs> but I'll also mention there's, uh, in terms of food reuse, so um, in this region, um, the groups that do food recovery have said that there is one community in this region whose health department is very strict and doesn't really allow them to, um, to get food from like the whole food salad bar and prepared foods from universities and places like that. And there are other communities that are friendlier to that. And um, I haven't really gotten to the bottom of it, but there's, there's an, op uh, an example also where public policy can really support under the right circumstances more food recovery for, um, for consumption. Um, so we have a couple more questions and only a few more minutes. So I'm going to, um, we're going to, we talked about maybe some international examples. I'm not sure. Actually, if, do you have anything quick? I go do. for it. Yeah. Well, just on this <laughs> note, so a lot of, um, a lot of my work has been international and I do actually think that there's more for the U.S. to learn uh, internationally than we have been. And so uh, a lot of my work actually while I was here at MIT was, um, was actually in Pune, in, uh, in India, in southern India. And Pune uh, is a city that um, had a continuous problem with their landfills, which is to say that as the city was rapidly developing, development kept on abutting landfills. And so communities uh, very effectively organized and protest um, and shut down landfills consecutively. Um, and the city realized that they couldn't continue to follow this centralized landfill model. And so what they did was decide to invest in decentralized food waste management. Uh, and so at a city level, they mandated not only that any new development had to have on-site composting, on-site food waste processing, and so that did show up as actually, you know, 
compost uh, and, and there was, it led to lots of innovation in terms of really small, it's a dense urban environment, so that in the area of that coat closet, you could actually be processing uh, several hundred pounds of food every single day. Um, and so really thinking about how we use those spaces and it meant that those, the nutrients, again, that were being produced in that building were actually being able to be used by residents for their plants, uh, um, in landscaping, and so it really incentivized developers to be, that they had to be thinking about that. And then really thinking about how you create other values in the community by processing in a more decentralized way, food waste for biogas to be able to power cooking at the schools in the, in the community and really using anchor institutions effectively. So I've been really impressed and continue to, to not see cities in the Western world pursuing some of the, the models that have been really successful in India and then also um, another model that's been very popular in Europe is really connecting and part of my research looks at uh, how European cities tend to be able to enable more direct consumer to consumer connection whereas in the US because of uh, concerns about liability, there tends to be an institution in the middle. So donors donate to some nonprofit that then gets it to the people who need it. Whereas in Europe, we see a lot more direct from producer to consumer of what of, of edible food, um, both produce and, and processed food. And so I think that's a really interesting, whether that's the fridge model, which is sort of community fridges, um, it requires a lot of trust. Uh, and that's not something we necessarily have in abundance in the US. But I think that it's really interesting to look at those kinds of policies and to really, from an environmental justice perspective, be emphasizing the more decentralized we can be producing and processing our compost, our food waste, the more important it is because to continue to have the burdens of food waste processing, whether that's in a large scale uh, composting facility or biogas facility continue to be on communities that have been marginalized remains inequitable. And so I've been, um, DC has had a lot of effective community composting models and having some of the small businesses in the space really be building that power up, that capacity up locally and from the city side encouraging people to be composting in those community uh, composting which is a more resilient system, both resilient to climate, environmental disasters, but also to, uh, to social challenges. Great, thanks. Um, so what are the innovations that you see happening now or that you think should be happening um, in this space? Hmm, it's, uh, I think it's a, you know, this, is the, this is the segue question because right. we're about to hear about right. some of these really exciting innovations. Um, I, I think you know, we've addressed a number of them uh, so far. I think that the use of, um, uh, you know, distributed sensors, whether that is kind of, you know, physical sensors to understand, um, you know, the, 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 the status of food in various places to the sensors that we all carry around with us to actually enable us to connect with one another uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer model in order to, to address some of the food recovery uh, component. You know, I think there's a huge opportunity there uh, to, to grow that, and I'm excited to hear um, from some of you um, kind of what your ideas are in, in those particular spaces. I mean, this is just a, a couple among, you know, presumably many more ideas that are necessary. I think that there's a huge innovation edge around making it easier for producers and consumers to be connecting, to have throughout the distribution cycle that information exchange, which is one of the barriers, albeit not the only one, and then real innovations in, in um, in cooling, in transportation, and in intermediate processing. I think that there's a huge opportunity to really be thinking, Jonathan used this term earlier, but identifying the highest and best use for something and immediately connecting uh, that uh, waste stream to, to that highest and best use. So whether that's actually going into an existing manufacturing facility or being that intermediate 
processing of food to be a place that, it, uh, in, into a form it can be used by others. I think there's a huge amount of opportunity there. And, um, you know, uh, I am excited to hear about all of the businesses. Uh, and I do think highest and best use, remembering that people are first, but I also think that there's a huge opportunity. Food that we would not think about serving other humans, mm -hmm. but serving to pets. Um, I think that there's actually an enormous amount of opportunity there as well. The pet food industry is enormous in the United States. And however we may feel about that, um, it is fascinating to think about to think about that and to think about the other industrial um, the other industrial uses. And I've been really intrigued by whether that's the um, companies that are really creating new alternative grain products from spent grains from brewers or using in our brewery as our brewery industry explodes in the United States, thinking about other ways that food wastes can actually be put into those sort of semi-industrial brewing processes is really fascinating to me too. Cool. All right, so one final question before Q&A for both of you. How do each of you handle your food scraps? Uh, <laughs> Am I allowed to pitch a company? Because yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we, yeah, yeah, we, uh, we, we just we subscribe to Bootstrap, and um, yeah, um, and th they've been incredibly kind of good uh, partners to the communities in which they operate. I uh, bootstrap Compost is a kind of home. Uh, do we have reps here from them? No, just 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 a just, fan. Just a fan. Um, <laughs> it's a, a curbside. It's a subscription curbside collection model. You get a dedicated. Uh, barrel and they will replace the barrel kind of uh, and give you a clean one on your subscription schedule. It's one of a, a few different private... And they private can compost back, right? Uh, yeah, you can get compost back if it's useful to you and if not, uh, you can donate it too. They've just changed that model, I think. But it's, it's one of a, a number of similar kind of startups uh, well, it's probably no longer startup phase, but um, a number of companies that, that are uh, seeing this opportunity for people who see the value and are willing to spend their own money be, uh, on doing this. And, and actually, communities in the Boston area are starting to partner with these private companies. I know that, I believe Newton just partnered, uh, they, they, they partnered with uh, an, another company. Uh, does anybody know the name? Black Earth? Is it, is it Black, oh, Earth? Black Earth? Black Earth. Black Earth, yeah. So they partnered with Black Earth, uh, which is a, another one of these companies to get a discounted rate for Newton residents. So instead of the city rolling out another municipally run system, uh, it's a, more of an opt-in system at a discounted rate. So I would not necessarily recommend my system to all but the the like most <coughs> committed um, and with the most committed roommates. But um, I have a multi-part system. One is I have an in-home compost machine in the form of my rabbit. He eats uh, most of my greens and food scraps uh, from my kitchen, turns them into fantastic compost for my garden. Um, but I also have uh, been able to, with the rest of my housemates, commit to a. Um, we have five different bins in our freezer. One. Uh, for stock vegetables um, that I, I make stock with, one for my shrub vegetables, which if you haven't gotten into shrubs, they're the mm -hmm. cocktail element of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and so I make my own shrubs at home um, with my fruit, my fruit scraps. Um, and then all of that goes into our compost drop-off in DC. Farmers markets uh, throughout the city collect uh, food that goes to one of our small uh, or DC startups um, that composts food waste locally. And then what's left, that can't go to my rabbit, to my stocks, or to my shrubs, um, I, I do the compost drop off. Um, so it definitely has, uh, yeah, right? It's multi, it's <laughs> multifaceted, but I also do, um, you know, I think some of the other elements of really thinking that, that many would uh, recommend of thinking at a higher level about how we really reduce that. And so I make a lot of stews and the sort of like everything in the kitchen that's about to go bad, how do I turn this into one recipe? Uh, and I make great popsicle soups and smoothies, which mm -hmm. I think is the food waste solution. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I should say that, you know, there's, uh, I found we talked about barriers uh, earlier. I have a 14-month-old, and the amount of food waste has gone up quite significantly uh, with a baby who decides that he wants one bite of something. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's, you know, uh, you know, some of these solutions are more applicable to some <laughs> lifestyles than others, let's say. Fair enough. Yeah. Great. So um, why don't we take Q&A from the audience? Uh, I've heard that gene editing has been used to create uh, potatoes that can last for six months. Mm. Now, what do you think of technologies like that? 
to increase the shelf life of these vegetables? Will they actually help make the supermarkets waste lesser or just buy more and waste a lot more? Mm. <sighs> well, I think that that's such an interesting question because even without gene editing, thinking about breeding, that the reason we have golden delicious and red delicious apples are because they are the ones with the longest shelf life, but it is essentially a mealy apple for six months rather than a mealy ap apple after a month. Um, and so as a, somebody who obviously cares a lot about food and food waste, I definitely have um, feel conflicted about it. I do think that it is um, for things like our berries, which uh, I have been intrigued to see more and more supermarkets saying, you should only expect if you buy these raspberries, they will last in your fridge for one to two days. So not to have the expectation that you can have raspberries for a week, like you need to eat them in two days. And that's certainly true for raspberries. Um, and so I think that it's an interesting question. I also think that the way that our food distribution and the economics of it are set up is it really encourages, we drive people to buy in bulk. Um, and so the, the possibilities, and particularly in a city like ours where there are are over 100,000 residents who do not have a supermarket within two miles of them, of them. To get to a supermarket might take two bus changes. You are buying in bulk because that's not something you can go to the supermarket every three days. So I think that it's really interesting to think about how that technology can be used and, and who it serves. Um, and to recognize that we're getting to a point where like, yes, we can make food last an infinitely long time, but what are we trading for that? Yeah, and, and also, I, I, without changing anything else of the system, it, it, it's just going to create, I think you, you, you laid out the scenarios, and I don't, I, I think that, um, you know, before, the, where in places in the world without a cold chain, you know, you have waste existing in one part of the, uh, you know, the food value chain, food life cycle, and in places with a cold chain, you have food waste popping up somewhere else, so in a situation where you have very long shelf life foods, I expect you're just going to have that waste shifted mm -hmm. along if nothing else in the system is, is also changed. Just add to that, in this specific example of potatoes, <coughs> potatoes, if stored right, will last for six months, right? right. So you know, that to me is, is a, you know, a solution looking for a problem, but I think Related to that, though, there's a lot of ways that we can store our food so that it lasts longer, and so there needs to be more education about that. And I think we also need to um, perhaps not be so wedded into having every single food available 365 days a year and eat more seasonally, and that will help create, I, I think, some less, less food waste as well. That's a great point. When you look at this from a, a system perspective, uh, is there a certain amount of food waste required in the system to make sure there's, you know, access to mm. food and that it, the system's robust? And if so, like, how do you think about that problem? That's a really great insight, and I think you're probably right, and I think we're probably very far away from that place. Um, you know, I, I, uh, it's, there's a, a very important cultural aspect uh, that comes first, which is that people, I think I have um, colleagues who study waste and marketing, uh, they, that the research there shows that uh, if there is a sparsely uh, filled you know, bin at a supermarket, people won't buy that f the food that's left over. It has to be full. And so th th this is a cultural um, a dynamic, but it, well before we get to this issue of making sure that, that you have enough to address both variability in supply and variability in diets and, you know, the, 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 this, the stochasticity of our, of our supply chains, which is, I, th I think, where you're, where you're getting. Um, it's a great insight and something that maybe I'll, I'll look at in a research project, but um, I do expect that we're pretty far away from that place. Yeah, I think that that's a great. I think that that's a great perspective, and that our pursuit of zero waste is to get sort of as close as possible, thinking about zero as an asymptote that we can just continue to try to get closer to. Um, but I also think that. Um, you know, there are some really creative things that I see emerging in DC in these neighborhoods that have far fewer access to supermarkets. Um, nonprofits in the city have supported a network of healthy corner stores, so where a corner store has a little fridge and some um, prepared foods and some produce. <coughs> and what's interesting about that is, of course, the risk is carrying produce so that people can find the greens they want. Um, and so some other innovative businesses coming up and saying, okay, we'll guarantee that we get you this food. If you have haven't sold it within a week, which is sort of the farthest out that 
this might last, we'll take it back and process it into a prepared food. Um, and so that's sort of thinking about how we address access, but also reducing the risk of it, is I think in connecting the dots and having uh, providers, having entrepreneurs who are really thinking holistically, how do I capture the most value? And yes, selling it to someone at retail price is best. And if not, then selling it to them as a value added product is next. We do have to get to the startup pitches because we're a little bit over, but thank you all very, very much. Appreciate it. Hi, um, my name is Ian. This is one of my co founders, Julian. We're with a startup uh, out of Boston called Adaviv. Uh, we work in agriculture technology, so we work actually on the cultivation or production side of the of the value chain. And um, the problem that we're trying to help solve is that of uh, of, of crop loss due to pest disease um, and pathogens every year, which is a, a huge problem in agriculture. Um, but specifically, we work uh, in greenhouses and indoor farms, so we're also trying to help them become more efficient operations. And um, in terms of this theme of, of, of waste, we're trying to help them eliminate waste in their resources, which includes labor, light, um, fertilizer, uh, and, and, um, and water. Um, and and uh, how we do that, what we're doing is, is building software that tries to help them achieve that level of care to do that but at big scales and um, reduce uh, their, their, their risk of, of these kind of crop losses and um, help them be more efficient through data-driven data uh, decision-making. Um, what we do specifically is uh, we're building and deploying basically plug-and-play sensing systems to scout the crops in, in these indoor farms and greenhouses. Um, so our expertise is in computer vision and AI and we're using that technology to, to keep an eye on all the plants in the greenhouse and um, basically try to uh, turn those data insights into actionable um, um, tasks that the, the growers can take through our software interface. Um, so we're trying to help them you know, track their, their performance indicators, help them uh, run more efficiently, um, find where those inefficiencies lie, and, um, and ultimately increase the yields while reducing uh, those losses um, by giving this, 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 this overview and constant eye on, on their plants. Um, in terms of our business model, it's a software subscription model, so we will charge you know, per square foot uh, per year, um, and just for the software, we we basically provide the hardware as a as a as a as a part of the service. Um, our stage um, we're piloting right now with some some commercial growers in the Massachusetts, uh, looking to expand with some some growers in Canada and other states. And we're at this stage where we're starting to add additional features to our product and really quantify, okay, exactly how much value are we adding to these customers um, um, and, and improve our product uh, based on that feedback. Yes, this one, a couple of lessons based on well, our journey so far. The first one is focus. Like there are many things that we want to solve, but we have limited resources and bandwidth. So we really need to nail down what we want to, what's the problem that you want to focus on. The second thing is fail fast. You have to experiment a lot to try to find your solution at the end. So we encourage you to experiment as much as you can. And finally, hear your customer. At the end, he is the one that is giving you the real issue and the real problem. We have leveraged a lot of the ecosystem around here to build this company, yep. and we encourage you to do the same. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Adaviv. <laughs> Up next, we've got Cambridge Crops. Hey, I'm Adam, uh, the CEO and one of the founders of Cambridge Crops. We make food last longer, so happy to d dive into that subject and how we think we can utilize that to really sustainably impact our supply chains from end to end. But what specifically we do is apply a protein to the surface of food that extends its shelf life quite drastically. We extract that protein from a natural source called silk, and it forms a barrier on the surface that's imperceivable, edible, and works by slowing down oxidation, water loss, and also slows microbial growth. And really, the, through hitting those three principal mechanisms, we've been able to extend shelf life pretty broadly across category. We're not only a whole produce company, we do cut fruit and veg, we do protein, and we even do confectionery. Everything is water-based end-to-end, 
allowing us to not only be cost effective and economical, but also drop into existing workflows. So we're looking to drop a powder into where food is being washed, processed, or coated today. And while we use silk, we're actually quite cost effective. Silk at the end of the day is a crop. 300,000 tons is produced every year, and there's number two silk cocoons that we can utilize for our process in a very cost efficient way. And so a couple of, of pilots that we have going on. Um, in the avocado world, we're able to extend the shelf life by two to three times, but we're not only making that rock hard avocado, so we're not totally just shifting the burden uh, all the way out to the end consumer, but we're also extending the peak ripeness window. And so that gives the consumer a better chance to eat a high quality product before it goes brown in your refrigerator. And one of our most exciting categories is really in the value added space. And so these are zucchini noodles. Um, a zucchini costs about a buck twelve a pound, and that's a pristine zucchini noodle. You take a number two, which is cents of that, um, you cut it, and it's worth three fifty to seven dollars a pound, and it goes from a couple percent shrink rate to twenty percent shrink rate. And in this case, we're able to bump up that that processed food item to its its basically parent vegetable shelf life. So we're going from seven days to upwards of twenty one, which is in line with the normal item. And then protein is also something that we think we uniquely can bring huge benefit to. This includes ground beef, muscle cuts. We're also working in the seafood space. But these are high shrink, high value items that are impacting retailers' bottom lines and are huge sources of environmental waste through redundant production. A lot of the advice are the same. Um, I think you know, having deep respect for the food supply is really important to getting things right here. Uh, it's complicated. It's sophisticated. And because of that, a lot of problems arise and focusing is difficult. So that's really important. Um, one of the most invest, uh, important resources we found is really value adding investors. More and more people are finding passion in the space and, and really leaning on them as both financial resources as well as thought partners has been extremely effective to us. And where we really started is developing deep relationships with stakeholders in these supply chains. They have to believe in what you're doing, you have to solve problems together, and ultimately those relationships are what's gonna drive success. Thank you very much. Great, thank you Cambridge Crops. <clears throat> Up next we've got Green Choice. Uh, my name is Galen, I'm the founder, one of the founders and the CEO of Green Choice. Um, so first I wanna apologize for the condition of our slide deck, I did not know we could customize them. So. Um, bear with me, all right? Oh, we couldn't. Ah. So rule number one and lesson number one is break the rules. Um, so we, we are a food discovery and insights platform. We help you find the right food for you based on whatever your dietary preferences and values are. So that means helping you find healthy food that's great for you and great for the planet. The reality is, is there's a growing number of options, right? The average grocery store has over 20,000 food products available to you, and the number of options is only increasing. Now in parallel, we as consumers are trying to make choices around diet, health, and sustainability, and looking for specific characteristics in the products and foods that we're buying. The reality is, is that all we have to help us do this is a very traditional, basic label with claims that don't always tell you what you want to know, and varying degrees of transparency. So we come in and we do the research for you, and we have built a unbiased rating system we call our green score that evaluates products across different dimensions of health and sustainability. And you, this past summer we launched a mobile app which simplifies and tracks healthy and sustainable grocery shopping. So we're basically your grocery shopping companion. You can search and browse for products. You can also scan products in the store where you can see our rating and basically easy to understand information that breaks down products across nutritional density, processing, food safety concerns, and environmental footprint. And this enables you to make a really kind of informed choices as you build your shopping list. And then after, we found that feedback is critical to improvement. So you're able to scan your receipt and get a breakdown of your purchase across different dimensions of nutrition and sustainability and kind of track your progress over time. And we nudge you with little suggestions on how to improve. So uh, kind of 
how does this, this, some, uh, this spring will be enabling online ordering. So we charge basically retailers and food brands a commission when you order through us. Uh, and in the future, we actually will feed insights from our platform back to those food brands. And we see this really as a huge opportunity to leverage the industry to produce healthier and more sustainable products from two angles. One from demand, but also through empirical evidence. Like people really respond to these distinct attributes. Um, so a couple lessons, I would just say quickly, one, assume you're wrong about your product, right? Uh, it's stake, talk to as many stakeholders as possible. You get caught up in your ego, you wanna start building, talk, 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 it's way less expensive in the long run. I think building off of this, um, whatever you think is your MVP, probably cut it in half. It's probably a lot simpler. We made this mistake, but really, like whatever you think is the easiest way to solve it, it's, it's much simpler than you think. Yeah. And, yeah. Great, great. Thank you so much. Thanks. <clears throat> Up next is Magnumer. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ravish Majit. I'm the founder and CEO of Magnomer. And I would like to switch gears a little bit here from talking about food waste to talking about the packaging in which our food comes. Um, it may not be news to you that we do need recyclable packaging, but it, the ways in which it manifests itself these days may be something that you might want to take away from today. For this, I want to take the example of plastic PD bottles. All of us use beverage bottles, your fruit juices, carbonated drinks, and so on. Almost all beverage bottles have a label on them. And manufacturing reasons dictate that the plastic that's used to make the label differs from the plastic that used to make the bottle. This is a very simple manufacturing feature which makes life very easy for manufacturing, keeps costs low, but it's a huge problem in recycling. Recyclers now have to separate out these labels away from the bottle during recycling, <coughs> which is A, not cost effective, and B, it's just not effective, period. It's an extremely technologically challenging problem to solve for these recyclers, making recycling of these bottles itself uh, not viable economically. So what do we do? We at Magnomer are a materials company. Our product is centered around magnetizable inks, which can be directly applied and printed on packaging, such as the label on a bottle. So imagine a PepsiCo or a Coca-Cola bottle having four or five different colors on the label. Our magnetizable ink is effectively a sixth, an additional color that goes on during the printing process of that label, with one key difference. Because of its magnetizable feature, it now complements existing magnetic separation equipment in our recycling infrastructure, making it simple for the recycler to simply attract the magnet away, uh, sorry, attract the label away from the bottle during the recycle process. This not only makes the vi increases the economic viability of recycling itself, but also bridges a very important gap between manufacturability of the label and the packaging and the recyclability of the said packaging after end of consumer use. And this problem is not just specific to plastic PET bottles as I showcased. It happens across multiple packaging categories from beverage bottles to household and laundry products to aluminum cans, believe it or not, uh, plastic labels are used on aluminum cans these days, and also to multi-layer packaging to potato chip bags, which are inherently made of multiple different types of plastics welded with each other. So in all of these different categories, we are currently piloting and showcasing the viability of our magnetic ink technology. Uh, coming to where we are as a company, we currently just finished our first pilot with PepsiCo, working on one of their um, beverage brands, showcasing the viability of our technology on their on their PET bottles, and are working with label manufacturers like Fuji Seal, which is one of the largest label manufacturing globally. Great. Um, Great. With that, uh, yeah. just want to end and 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 conclude with uh, what when we think about packaging next time, think about how it is actually designed for recyclability. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Magma. <coughs> Next up is New Bedford Port Authority. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ed Washburn. I am the Port Director in New Bedford, and uh, I'm going to talk today about one of our initiatives is called the New Bedford Ocean Cluster, which is a spin-off of the port uh, where we focus on food waste um, as well as a few other things that are more in line with, with our business development. Uh, I'll just add, if everyone ate a lobster like my dad eats lobster, we would not have to talk about food waste at all <laughs> in the seafood industry. 
So, and, and I hope he sees this on, on WGBH at some point. Um, so we're talking about, uh, you know, so New Bedford is the number one fishing port in the United States. Last year we landed uh, 150 million pounds of fish valued at over uh, almost $400 million. And it's, it, uh, and, and that pales in comparison to who we are as a, as a processor. We have over, over 40 processors in the port. Um, you know, some are moving 7 million pounds a day of fish product in and out. Uh, and, and just in fish alone, ground fish, cod, skate, haddock, uh, we, we're producing about 30 million pounds a year of uh, what we call gurry. My dad calls the inside of the, of the lobster the gurry, which he, he also eats. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're dealing with a huge amount of, of gurry. And right now, almost all of that is going toward bait, uh, pet food, fertilizer, uh, and some flavoring. So not really high value things, but it's all being, uh, you know, none of it is going into the, into the waste streams, which is, which is great. Uh, what, what we're trying to do is, uh, is really look at the ocean cluster uh, model that they have in Iceland and in Norway. We joined in 2017 the Iceland Ocean Cluster where they're able to look at other uh, value added products that come out of the fish waste stream. Uh, belts, cod skin belts, cod skin uh, ties, uh, really, you know, collagen, all sorts of things that are, are much higher in value. And because of that, since 1980, they've increased the value of the landings by four times uh, while, cutting the, while cutting the actual landings in half, so it, it, in real terms. So they've been able to really get more value out of the natural resource when it comes to the commercial fishing industry. So our goal is to, is to do the same thing, to work with uh, the startups in, in, in Massachusetts, in New Bedford in particular, um, to really try to get more out of the fish right now. For, exa for example, in something like redfish, we're only using about 30% of it. The rest of it goes to pet food or, or bait. Uh, so increasing it so that 100% utilization, getting higher value, and incentivizing fishermen to go catch this awesome fish is one of the things that we're working on. And in terms of advice, uh, look abroad, uh, you know, in places like Iceland and in Norway, they're really doing some amazing things with food waste, uh, in particular in the seafood industry. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions with my few seconds left. Just kidding. Thank you, New Bedford Port Authority. Last but not least, we have Shameless Pets. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex. I'm co-founder of Shameless Pets. I uh, first met my co-founder, James, back in 2017 when he was working at Target at the Food Innovation Lab here in Boston. He was working on circular agricultural um, solutions for their supply chain. Um, I have a very different background. I come from product development and food science. I was a former director of R&D uh, for Mary's Gone Crackers. It's a gluten-free, allergen-friendly snack food company in California. Um, and so when I was working in CPG in the human food space, um, the trend that got me most excited and the the ingredients that got me most excited were actually spent grain, but coming from a um, gluten-free company, it's not something that I could actually utilize. So when James and I um, got together, we, we found that we had both had a shared passion for creating food waste solutions um, and also have a love of pets. Believe it or not, I took that photo professionally before I even started uh, Shameless Pets, so I am absolutely <laughs> one of those people. Um, but yeah, so at Shameless Pets, we create all natural grain-free dog treats using upcycled ingredients. Um, a lot of these ingredients are coming from either landfill or compost. Um, some of these ingredients, actually a lot of them are not suitable or something that a human would want to eat. So for instance, that um, lobster body and lobster shell actually, which is a, a natural source of glucosamine and conjoint for pets. And we actually found is a, also acting as a prebiotic for pet gut health. Um, we can utilize that ingredient and, and put it into our dog treats to support their health as well. Another example being eggshells as a natural source of calcium coming out of egg breaking facilities from the egg liquid cartons that you see on the shelf. Um, so we take nutritious food from farmers and food processors that are otherwise going to landfill or compost and turn it into our healthy dog treats. Um, we are a CPG company. We are selling product currently in wholesale through food drug mass channels, grocery independent and online channels as well. Um, we're already in market. I'm currently working on new product development as well. Um, most excited national or next milestone is that we just launched nationally with Target last week. Um, so if you are a pet lover, have some dogs, and you want to support our mission, please head to Target and pick up a pouch. Shameless plug right there. Um, <laughs> so top three lessons learned so far. Um, 
James and I as co-founders have found so much value out of each other's experience. Um, me coming from food science, working on supply chain and product development, him coming from a retail um, background and understanding how to, we, we want to create this product and how do we actually get it onto shelves into people's hands. Um, and keeping scalability on the forefront for the biggest impact, I think, is really important. There's um, ingredients that we can go to target with, and then there's ingredients that we can't in terms of availability and accessibility. And right now, our ingredients are taken from these processors. They're dehydrated and created into a shelf-stable powder. Um, and so in terms of scale, looking at how, we're, how are we going to get distribution is how are we going to support that through our upcycled ingredients. There are things that are... Uh, Time's up, but um, please come and chat with me. Uh, these are all the resources we found really helpful. And uh, yeah, cheers. <laughs> thank you, Shameless Pets. <clears throat> and thank you to all of these startup uh, participants.